Hello, and welcome to Maximal Fire. I'm Alex. And I'm Johnny. And we have returned from the warp. So, Johnny, hello again. I seem to be spending a hello, lot of hello. time with you at the moment. Getting pretty sick of your face. Yeah, uh, feeling is mutual. Yes, I am good. <laughs> if not, incredibly tired. Um, but yeah, had a pretty, pretty sick, sick weekend. Yeah, it's been very, very busy, wasn't it? Because we recorded uh, the last podcast um, last Tuesday. Um, which was us kind of like getting prepared for um, going out to the Greetings from the Warp um, narrative event up in um, Wellingborough um, mm-hmm. in, I want to say, Northampton, Northamptonshire. Yes, Northam- Northamptonshire. Northamptonshire. That sounds like a mouthful. Northamptonshire. I think it's Northamptonshire. Y- yeah. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, yeah, no, it is. No, <laughs> yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Up north, anyway, it wasn't quite past, you know, the proper break of the north, the wall. Right. It's not further up than the, the Watford Gap service station, which is where I kind of class as uh, the true north beginning. Um, but yeah, so we we did that on the we recorded this on the Tuesday, did all of the editing, got the video out and the podcast out. But the Friday, uh, we then woke up at four o'clock in the morning and went up and did an event. So it is now the following Tuesday, although you will probably be seeing this a couple of weeks after because um, life is going to happen and we need to get some stuff together, as you will find out later on in this episode of cool stuff that we're going to check in this episode. Um, but we thought we will record this again while it's all fresh in our heads and also thought we would have a look at some interesting developments from White Dwarf. So- oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, in proper organised Games Workshop fashion, we got a full battle report of uh, Legion's Imperialis before the game had even dropped. Um, I think this is largely to do with the fact that White Dwarf does all of their articles or um, issues, copies, months and months ahead. So I think that they were intending on this being here, um, well, rather, um, they were intending on Legion's Imperialis being here before this article dropped. But it, e- either way, it was it was nice to get a little bit more content um, for Legion's Imperialis. It was nice to kind of see how a game went. Um, so we thought we'd kind of brush up upon some of the things within this article. I've got my copy because I'm a subscriber to White Dwarf. Um, so I, I am a filthy heretic who is not a subscriber to White Dwarf. So this is a uh, live reaction to uh, <laughs> to the to the article and the battle report and how stuff works, which I am very excited for. Yeah, well, I mean, like the TLDR for this, right, is that if you want to kind of... If you were hoping to read the battle report and find out how the game works now... Um, there wasn't a great deal in there. Like, there was a few interesting things. I think the most important thing and the most interesting thing that came out of the battle report was seeing what a 3,000-point force looks like. Um, There was a really interesting um, couple of pages uh, which you got, and I'll hold it up in front of the camera if you're watching on YouTube or videos, um, of having how two forces kind of... Look, is that I can't see the screen now. Is that you can see that? Yeah. Um, higher, look behind. There we go. Perfect. Um, and that is oh, no nudge higher. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, we're 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 well prepared. Now you can look at the book instead of my face. Um, <laughs> but we got a really good look at seeing what a um, an actual sort of battle force looked like, um, and some of the points around it as well. Uh, so things like Reaver Titans. It seems that. It looks to be anyway that the weapons aren't like extras for a titan. You just get the same points because both a 
a Reaver with a Gatling laser and Vulcan Megabolter was exactly the same points as a Reaver with a Turbo Laser Destructor Melter Gun and Chain Fist. Uh, I would expect the latter to be slightly more expensive if, by AT um, standards. Um, but it was also, good, you know, there was also some cool sneaky peek little bits in here, uh, like the guy had, the guy Thomas Clark, he'd used um, drop pods quite extensively and he'd used um, some fast attack um, squadrons like Outriders, Javelins, Land Speeders, Scimitars. Um, and I think that that was, this was why we got that reveal the other week. So it'd all gone a little bit quiet on the legions imperialis front uh for a while um and i thought that they weren't really gonna re sort of release anything because you know they were building up this backlog of expectation you know this is coming out and this is coming out and then this um uh, detachment is coming out and it's just all starting to sort of back up and i thought maybe they'd hold on to a few things a bit longer before they revealed them so they can get the original stock out and then they've got more stuff to talk about later on so when they announced the um the drop pod news um and they announced the land speeder news it was a bit of a surprise um but it became very apparent that they needed to do that before this um article although i think it would have been quite cool if they'd have just stayed completely silent about all of that yeah. stuff and then just let us all take this in as part of the white dwarf and see jesus christ they've got jet bikes and there's drop pods and that's all really cool and like just get hyped up about the game again uh, but whatever you know i'm not i'm not going to take anything away from them um but yeah it is you know, there's a lot of models that's that's the first thing that kind of struck me uh they've said three thousand points on a five foot by four foot is kind of like the the main normal kind of points that you're playing to that's a lot of stuff um and the, i love that board size by the way that's a really good board size all those six by four mats that we used to have from 40k and stuff like that yeah i mean and you no know, even even the ones for at like oh i mean what we've bought done in the past is we've bought six by fours and if you need a four by four well you just you know either turn it the other way and run lengthways mm. over a four foot table, or you just run a piece of tape down the side and put your terminals, you know, blocking off two yeah. feet on the side. So a lot of people are going to have six foot, six foot by four foot mats, and they're not going to have to rebuy loads of stuff like people had to do for, um, you know, the, the other mainstream games, which mm. is nice. Um, but yeah, the, the to Thomas Clark he took entirely Blood Angels, lots of fast stuff, lots lots of deep striking drop cards and stuff. And then James Gallagher, who was on the other side, so these are both two of the individuals who helped design the game. Um, he'd taken a bit more of a piecemeal force. Uh, he had um, quite a lot of Death Guard, but then he also had a detachment of Emperor's Children, uh, Solar Auxilia, and he had you know a Legion um, Reaver as well. So you know, his, his force had a couple of um, special rules uh, to deal with, whereas obviously the Blood Angels only had the one. So I know that they kind of were talking at the beginning that it's you know a mixed force game you know you can take blood angels with white scars and stuff and like opening up like these different legio special rules seems to be kind of like the main benefit for doing it i couldn't really see from reading the article if there was any particular benefit to keeping everything in one legio um but it, it was yeah. it was interesting. Uh, there wasn't much in the way of rules revealed. There was a couple of like explanations about how objectives work. Um, there was a couple of explanations about like what the orders phase is, uh, and you know how they decided secondary objectives. Um, but otherwise, it was it was pretty light in detail when it came to actually. You know how many dice are they rolling? Uh, what type of um, what kind of results are leading to things dying? It was like, and this person shot at this person, and stuff exploded. Um, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's got to fit in a white dwarf article, right? So they, they can't go into too much detail. But I think because everyone's dying to hear about 
how you play the game, I think I was just hoping for a little bit more explanation, but it was still very satisfying. Mm. Um, one, one interesting thing which um, uh, I did kind of glean from looking at it was that uh, Titans seemed to die quite quickly. Um, there was a Titan wiped out in turn one. Spoiler alert, I should say. Um, oh. But um, it seemed to imply as well that when they die, stuff dies with them. So I don't know if we're going to get kind of like a slightly more scaled back version of, you know, um, meltdown rules or something. I'm just trying to find the actual article in the book or, or what it was, where it said about it. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it, it was interesting. It was nice to see like the, um, the death guards, appear to have like a special rule where they can make two areas of terrain dangerous terrain, which was interesting. I guess they like infect a certain area of the board. Um, although not not much detail was shared as to how that really affected, um, you know, the Blood Angels as they were fighting through it. The um, the Blood Angels have got... Um, i trying to find their uh, exact special rules. Oh yeah, they have Encarmine Fury, which allows them to move up to three inches after winning a combat. Um, the Death Guard rule is called Sons of Barbarous. Um, and then the Emperor's Children have Exemplars of War, which very much seems to be kind of like a bit of a dominant strategist, if you're going to use that sort of comparison back to AT. So it enables them to win the initiative. I guess the difference being there is that it, it sounds like you know the initiative is decided at the beginning of the game, and then you you know, or beginning of the turn, I should say, rather than an AT where dominant strategists can seize it at any point. Um, but yeah, like it's it 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 certainly has a kind of a kind of halfway house AT to more traditional war game feel about it. You know, lots of units, but mm. the you go, I go. Um, Activation seems quite fun. And that seems to be done on like a detachment level um, rather than unit level from what I can gather from the article. Um, but stuff dies insanely quickly. Like I was reading the first turn and I was like, what is actually left at the end of turn one? Because <laughs> yeah. well, there's, there's a lot of units as well mm. by the looks of it. Yeah, there was, um, there was a lot on there, but a lot died very, very quickly. Mm. Uh, I think this is going to be quite a quick and brutal game. Um, oh yeah. By turn, um, I think it was round four. The game ended four and five. Technically, don't know. Round four and five was summarised in like half a page of the. So you know, it obviously not much happened. Um, but yeah, like lots of stuff died at the beginning, and then it kind of, I think, it slowed down a little bit, and it became a bit more sort of tactical rather than just shooting. Um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it's um certainly been a bit to ponder about and think about um mm. but i yeah i would have i would have liked i guess a little bit more explanation but then i guess everybody probably would have liked a little bit more explanation but i think the problem was is that they assumed that the rules would be out by now so it's been written in such a format that you know there's there's calls to rules on certain pages of the rule book um like it says um, I think it's quite early to the beginning that you know that you know to check out this rule, go check out page such and such on the the main rule book. It's like, yeah, love to, but can't. Um, but one of the big departures from AT, and I think more into sort of what we've seen in sort of Age of Sigma and um, 40k is the scoring of victory points every single turn. So they played a season hold mission. Um, where there were six placed. There was two in their own deployment zones, uh, two in neutral territory, and two in the opponent's um, uh, deployment zone. And holding two, um, holding one in your own granted you two victory points. If it was in neutral, it was worth five. If it was in your enemy's deployment, it was worth seven. Um, and these kind of accumulated every single round. So I, I could see a real benefit from... Um, you know, the Blood Angels deciding to do a drop pot of socks, that basically meant that from the beginning they would be um, contesting objectives in the opponents of the half. 
so quite how devastating those drop pod assaults might be um i guess remains to be seen it's it's hard to sort of see from from one battle report um but the other interesting thing was the amount of terrain that they had kind of used as part of a game and it wasn't it wasn't as dense as i was expecting it to be i think i was fearing a little bit that we were going to have to significantly up our terrain game especially around the scatter um terrain sort of thing because we've got lots of lots of um blocking terrain but not much in the smaller mm. ruin stuff um whereas you know really they they had a bunch of buildings all lining down e either edge um but that um they didn't really play much part of the battle you could have just probably ignored most of that um, and the rest of the battlefield was pretty sparse. You know, it certainly wasn't kind of AT levels of blocking terrain, you know, big multi-story buildings. It was generally sort of single level Civitas, um, which obviously it means your Civitas is going to go a lot further um, if you're only expected to do them on kind of like one, maybe two high, whereas if... Mm most self-respecting at players they need stuff to hide reavers and stuff right so they're two three four um civitas high mm -hmm. it might bode well for the new pack um yeah of terrain see see if it can kind of go a little bit further um but yeah there's some exploding buildings as a result of dem uh, demolisher rules so we're gonna have to looks like we're gonna have to make a few versions of exploding buildings um or at least yeah, ruin we can make versions. a load of you can make a load of just like generic ruin markers as well for yeah. very specific um, train pieces. You know, the grim dark stuff. Don't necessarily want to get another set just to smash it up. So yeah. maybe we can just do some, you know, rubble alternatives. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, man, this is sounding sounding pretty awesome, even yeah. if there isn't a lot of information. Um, it, it looks it looks sick, and I you know I I love mm -hmm. looking at the old traditional style kind of. Um, um oh yeah battle maps and stuff and my camera's focusing on that but you know it's uh i love kind of like geeking out over the object but like the what would you call those the unit badges insignias or or whatever you would call yeah them. um yeah. i mean it's the perfect game game for that old uh like general as in like war general style um, that's what they're selling it for strategy right? you know that, that, that's yeah, how should... they're selling the game that is is this kind of grand strategy um mm -hmm. so you should get those wooden uh sticks where you push the push the units across the big war maps yeah <laughs> yeah in wartime <laughs> just what what was quite interesting um and i think i've said what was quite interesting a few times now there was a few fairly interesting things inside it but um you know if you like I say, unfortunately, like if um, we should probably put a spoiler warning at the beginning of this episode because there will be spoilers if not that people aren't watching, aren't reading the battle reports. But um, hopefully, by the time that this is out, the battle reports will, you know, the White Dwarf will have been out for a couple of weeks. Um, but um, air superiority seemed quite um, quite key. The you know what the, the blood angels lose all of their xiphons and fire raptors and stuff quite early, and then that basically leaves the death guards xiphons to kind of just fly around unmolested, um, and become very hard to take care of. You know while they're strafing into titans and things like that, which is is quite cool because we don't get like the aerial assaults on titans outside of that one strat, which is all right. Um, but not kind of oh, it's so cool. It is so cool, isn't it? The combined yeah. arms element is is just awesome. Man, I'm I'm so excited for it. <laughs> I think the biggest kind of reveal slash confirmation that we saw from this article was um they have addressed what's gonna be in in what book. So the vast majority of um the units which are <clears throat> being played with in the battle report will be featured inside the um main rule book they've also said that um th they use the objective tokens uh, which come in the box but it's also going to be packaged along with the rule book so it sounds like if you buy the rule book 
similarly to kind of when I bought my um, Age of Sigmar, Cities of Sigmar box set, I got the cardboard tokens with the you know the rule book. It sounds like they're going to be doing that with the standalone rule book as well. So if you don't want to buy the actual awesome. box, you can still get the. I mean, I'm, this isn't confirmed. I'm, this is just based on what I'm reading. It sounds like the tokens will be shipped with the main rule book as well as you know what you would get from the box set as well. Um, but the only things which aren't um, included in the main rule book are the drop pods, the scimitars, uh, land speeders, all of, all of that. Um, what do they call that? Uh, the Sky Hunter Phalanx. Or Phalanx. Um, they are all going to be in another um, supplement, which is going to come out apparently shortly after release. And the supplement itself is going to be called The Great Slaughter. Which, you know, got, got me kind of thinking. Like, drop pods... Mm-hmm. Great Slaughter. Mm-hmm. Drop Site Massacre. Maybe. Oh, hell yeah. Would be... I mean, it's an iconic... Iconic moment in Horus Heresy history, right? I I would hope that they would look to kind of... I mean, we don't know what missions are, are in the main rule book. I would assume that they'd probably be focused around the Siege of Terror. Um, mm. but it would be nice if we get like these supplements with additional rules which focus on the famous war zones um, of the you know of the front you know one dealing mm -hmm. with the drop site massacre one dealing maybe with Prospero one dealing with you know um, some of the sort of later wars I was going to say uh, the Beta Garmin Cthonia, Cthonia like, yeah. Beta Garmin cluster was a titan battle mostly but there were still lots of ground there were troops. marine elements yeah you know, perhaps that might be a future rule supplement which allows you to feel predominantly Titans with Legion support. Mm. We can hope that's what we want, right? Um, so, oh man, then the Beta Gar Garmin one would be like low gravity mission effects and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe. Oh, can you imagine? Part of me will be a little bit disappointed that we didn't get this for AT. Um, you know, I mean, I know we got like the Titan Death thing because there's a book called Titan Death, but like there were so many battles which I really wanted to to feature in an AT supplement. Um, most of all was uh, Talon, um, which would have been an awesome kind of supplement for AT, having the um, you know, Krytos on Talon, Talon, mm -hmm. Talon, however you want to pronounce it. Um, but maybe we'll see some of that. Um, with this as well um so yeah still still nothing though on on a release date and the longer this kind of goes on the more i'm thinking you know are we actually gonna see it this year oh don't put that energy out into the world <laughs> the only thing which gives me hope that we will and you know i'm still hanging my hopes on november is is that they announced officially that the old world is going to be one of the first releases of 2024. So is that meant to make me feel better? <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're well, saying we might not see it this year, <laughs> one of, one of two things is going to happen. Either it's been it'll be leapfrogged by old world, or we'll see it before the end of this year. And I I, I really hope it is. I mean, you know, it's coming sooner than we think. Apparently. Yeah, I don't know. That would be uh, a massive troll, yeah, from from them if they said if they release that statement and then release it after the old world, that would be insane. Yeah, yeah, I I would be less than impressed. I was really expecting them to um, reveal the release date at this weekend's. Um, Warhammer coverage. But what what event it was? Yeah, I guess I guess they wanted it was the to, anniversary, right? Yeah, I guess they wanted to hold it back for like actual new stuff. There's nothing really new here. Um, but uh, it's people just... are still waiting for that, right? It's like a little thing you could put in there, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. The big the biggest problem is is budgeting for us, not for Games Workshop. Like, yeah, 
you know, before they said, like, it's coming in August. So everybody kind of had, like, at least a month's notice that we should expect um, this game to drop and we could start putting our mo- hobby money aside, getting ready to basically drop, let's say, 120 quid on a box set, um, plus maybe, you know, the same again on terrain. But Or another box set. Or another box set. But, but the, the way it's kind of this sort of lack of information at the moment means that every Sunday, every time it rolls around and it's the Sunday preview, it's like, shit, is it going to be this week? Like, How, how badly is my wallet going to be ha- hammered? Um, mm-hmm. Because we're trying to kind of, we're doing other things. You know, like I I have a little bit held back um, to make sure that the, the channel gets enough. Uh, and we definitely will have, you know, enough to kind of, get this on on launch but if i want to add more stuff from my own personal wallet you know the channel's not going to pay for everything some of it has to come out of my pocket as well and so how yeah how much do i need to keep saving and i'm a hobby butterfly i want to buy other stuff as well the city's a sigma yeah. stuff I'm, I'm really enjoying painting at the moment and i'm the second wave or rather the the first wave however you want to you want to count it after the main battle force will probably drop in a month or so's time so mm-hmm. i want to save a bit of money for that as well um yeah it's it's frustrating and you know not everybody has um a youtube channel that they can uh, utilize patreon funds to kind of help get stuff ready for battle reports it's um out to the patreons yeah You're the best yeah, I mean, like we li- seriously couldn't do half the we stuff that we do without literally couldn't no, uh, without the support of our patrons. Um, it allows us to be on the front foot with this sort of stuff. We don't have to worry about finding 120 quid to buy the latest and greatest, and you know, or we might be, you know, a month or two late. We don't want to be late. We want to get this stuff to you as soon as we can. Um, mm. but yeah, it's just it's just frustrating. And, you know, I know certainly a lot of my friends play a lot of Necromunda as well and, you know, other games. And Necromunda in particular seems to keep people basically one foot out of the, um, out of poverty. It's, uh, mm-hmm. there's so many Forge World releases on that. Um, you know, Each one is so good. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, the new stuff that they just announced, the, uh, I forget the name of it, but the, the new Squat stuff, the Squat Prospector mm-hmm. stuff. And there's a there's a great looking vehicle in that, but you can guarantee that's because it's Forge World, that's gonna be another hundred and something quid. So that better not mm-hmm. land on the on the weekend that uh, Legions Imperialis is uh, is dropping for the sake of the people who I know who play that okay. as one of their main games as well. Um mm-hmm. these things never come at, at a time where it is um good and Games Workshop's model at the moment is very much buy it on release day or or wait slash hope Eight, it comes out months. later yeah yeah so that went from being like quite a positive kind of battle report um sort of a little look and getting a little bit excited to a little bit ranty and a bit um i think, I think it's fair obviously you know if it's not obvious i and i think i can speak on your behalf you know we, we are so excited for this release um it's just gotten to the point now where it's just a little bit frustrating. You know, we want to know what the plan is ahead. Um, we have a lot of plans for a lot of stuff when Legions does come out. Um, and it's hard to kind of plan life and that stuff at the same time. So And, and keep the hype going, going right? Keep, you know, they're, yeah. they're trying to build up the hype. They did a great job of building up the hype before August. Mm-hmm. And and then it kind of just fizzled out a little bit. And, and we've, we've seen it yeah. on... Um, you know, on the Discord, like this sort of frustration, there was a big, great, big influx of people who were excited about yeah. Legions Imperialis who joined the Discord. You know, it was super active on there, and now people have run out of things to talk about. You know, they can't even play the game, so they're falling back to other things. It's been pretty good for AT. People have dug out all of their Titans again and they're starting painting their Titans, and more people are playing AT, which is awesome. Like, mm. you know, I've always said this: this new game needs to be significantly 
good for it to take over AT from my kind of primary game, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. I have every hope that it would be in, you know, I have, you know, informed kind of um, opinions from a few people that it is a really good game to play. But mm. until I do it for myself, like, I, I, I need to make that determination. You know, last thing I want is to is for this not to be my bag. Mm. But the longer they kind of go and drag it out, the harder it is to get hyped up for it again. You know, we've... as you said, especially when there's there's so many other cool releases coming out. Yeah. Um. Okay. When it does come out, we're gonna uh be absolute goblins for many days trying to uh you know paint up everything that we get. Well, we um, we are gonna create our own hype, Johnny. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. We're gonna do it for ourselves. We've already started putting some plans in motion, and you know this was gonna be like a battle report podcast. Um, and we were a little bit sneaky with our phrasing with that because not only were we talking about the battle report in White Dwarf, um, but we've started planning our own as well and what we're going to do uh, when Legions hits. So to Johnny's point, full goblin mode for a week or two, I think, after the, uh, the game comes out. And then mm -hmm. as soon as is possible, we are going to hit the YouTube with a, a, a really poor battle report <laughs> where we get the rules wrong or left, right and centre um, yeah. and kind of like just uh, laugh at our incompetence. Um, but we will do one training game because we want to get this this out as quickly as possible because it will be absolutely sick. Everyone's hyped for Let's it. Let's learn together. Um, Let's learn together. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you never know. Um, GW might send us a box early mm, before you know, release. You, you keep hoping, Maybe. Johnny. You keep hoping. Maybe. Um, I think that Please. they've already gone out. If they've gone out, they would have gone out before. I don't think they'll send out mm. anymore. Um, um. But we've got some kind of big plans for this game, and mm -hmm. um, as well as obvious content like we're doing now um we are toying with the idea slash probably definitely as long as life doesn't do a 2022 um on on me again and kick me in the nuts um we've got a plan for a for a bat rat campaign oh yeah so oh yeah i i am hoping uh that uh, we can do that, and we'll get everything painted up. And we've already started planning, sort of how we're going to structure the campaign, sort of um, what st types of missions we're going to do. I think obviously we're waiting to see exactly what's in the box, but I think there may be an element of a bit of homebrew here and there, just for keeping it interesting. Um, you're sticking to your guns, though, aren't you? You are going to go um, the arch traitors themselves, um, the sons of Horus. The Sons of Horus. Absolutely. Oh my god, it's gonna be so cool. I mean see, um, seeing what I'm they've released at the moment, what 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 do you think in your head, how do you envision sort of how that force will kind of be structured? So um using ninety percent of the Astartes in the core box as uh Sons of Horus, I am then gonna do a tiny detachment um of uh, word bearers as like kind of a um, spiritual advisory uh, contingent in the um, in the ranks of the sons of Horus. Um, the uh, what are they called? Auxilias, human troops. They're going to be the Cephonian Conf uh, cohorts, which are the elite traitor um, uh, guard for the sons of Horus. Uh, in the Horus Heresy, um, yeah, just just gonna do a whole mi uh, mismatch of things. Obviously, there's gonna be Titans. Probably gonna be rebasing my Vulper Warhounds, as this is the, gonna be the only place that they're gonna find tabletop play and not just sitting in a uh, in a display cabinet. And I have three of them for some reason. I don't know why I made made three of them. Oh, obviously for um, a Ferox Manipul, surely. Oh, uh, surely, right? Um, not because I just thought they looked really really cool. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so probably going to be using those um, depending on how cool and how customizable the Titans are. If there's like some sick corruption rules that we can use, I'll use one of the Reavers instead that I've uh, gribblied uh, up. What, what yeah. was what were the troops called? I've forgotten the name of uh, when they basically accelerated the the gene oh. process, and there was tons of new new mm-hmm. um, uh, new space marines in a lot of the legions, but particularly in the in the Sons of Horus. Yeah, like un undeveloped, like unblooded uh, kind of space marines. Like mm. um, I've forgotten forgotten the exact term that they use i'm kind of imagining like lots of troops like almost like that sort of theme is that what i'm kind of feeling or no i kind of no (laughs) no i i think i think uh, i i like the sons of horus because they are like the elite fighting unit obviously by the time i love chaff but i love my chaos chaff in the form of hordes of cultists uh, and then you have like the elite Astartes backing them up that's always like been a really so that's really when cool the Cthulhuian cohorts are kind of coming into play yeah kind of we'll, we'll start with those um, if there are then like further down the line options for customizable militia uh, I'll have like hordes of just crazy chaos wor- worshippers just like you know hugging up the front line um, I really kind of want my, my Astartes especially at this high points cost where I box doesn't cover much really of it at all um i really want my astartes to remain like an elite elite unit throughout uh, i'm going to paint up one of the terminator units to be just Arian, um which should be fairly simple to to do especially at that scale you don't really have to worry about conversions um and yeah just just have fun with it it's gonna be a, such a fun game uh game just to have like just have fun and be creative with And we're all going to do the same bases, so it's going to be sick. Well, that's the hope. Yeah, we're going to try and keep it the same um, and try and persuade our kind of extended friends who are involved in our channel as well to do it um, so we mm-hmm. can all have matching um, matching armies. I, uh, what are you going to do? You, you've lost your instant access to jet bikes and, and, um, and yeah. speeders and all that sort of and, stuff. And I've lost my mojo a little bit. <laughs> For uh, mm. for painting white scars, um, so I did enjoy painting them, but again, like I think it will be one of those things when we know I, I can get a little bit more behind it. But I think seeing how the uh, lists kind of work and the detachments kind of work, I think very much scars will play a part in what I'm doing in the future. But I'm thinking now less main battle force, more um, detachments of uh, speeders, um, scimitars uh xiphons you know and anything because their special rule uh, um gives them a bonus to jink or a reroll to jink or something which is obviously a flyer um ability so i think it's going to be largely loads of that sort of stuff kind of on the sides they're going to be the guys who are sort of sweeping around the front taking the flank so you know lots of javelins outriders land speeders that that whole sky hunter phalanx pack um which they announced is going to be like awesome for that um, oh, yeah. And on top of that, you know, I've got m- maybe like one detachment of tactical marines in a Thunderhawk or something, or maybe some Terminators in a Thunderhawk and do like the, what they call the Keshig. Is it the Keshig? Mm-hmm. Yep. Keshig um, Elite, yeah. Uh, but the main core of what we're going to do, and this will set up the, the plans for the battle reports that we're going to do, um, I am switching and it's going to be Imperial Fists. So we are going to have. The Walls of Terror is going to be the setting for our for our battle reports, and we're going to try and link them together with, you know, when I win game after game, like usually happens, right, Johnny? Oh you yeah. Know, then obviously oh, I'll, yeah, I'll get tons of bonuses for for doing that, um, you know, but yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to force myself into doing something very different from what I, um, I say I'm forcing myself, but I've just said I've got like these super quick kind of guys who I'm going to keep you know up, up my sleeve but you know i've always been a very aggressive player so playing defensively has never been something which i have done you know i don't really do it very often 
So I think I like the idea of, of going fists and going like Dorados, um, Leviathans, uh, having some of those kind of like tarantula batteries, um, just big, heavy, punishing, sit back and sort of defend the walls kind of um, forces. And, and uh, when they finally kind of release them i don't think they've released like any assault squads yet have they they've not announced any assault squads mm, um not to my knowledge, no. but it, you know fafnir rand's um guys are gonna have to feature in there oh yeah at some point um and uh i just I, I i like the idea of theming the army around the the battle for the wall i've got an idea of one of like my um commanders of my um legion commands being painted up not as an imperial fist but maybe in the white of the lunar wolves and saying that little guy there right there you know that's 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 gavriel loken um, oh garvey yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna try and sort of focus on doing like little little things like that and and make it feel very um yeah, very the walls of terror. Maybe I need to find myself maybe like an old tech priest model so I could have him as like maybe stick old um, uh, uh, Ark and Land on a base or something. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> just for, oh, that'd be just so for cool. giggles, you know. You could do uh, like a uh, a cool... Oh, here we go. Look, the ideas, they start they start flowing once we go, we go into this. Um, you could do like a objective marker set to have like Ark and Land, you know, and they... And he always gets like in the middle of trouble and <laughs> needs rescuing like all the time. It seems who, we right, have him as an objective. I think what we need is if anybody who's listening right now is able to sculpt a eight millimeter orangutan, then that would be. <gasps> uh, I would love to to get a copy of that so I could have his little buddy. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> you could do like a little. You could do the entire squad. You it's not an orangutan, the, uh, just... is it? It's it's smaller than that. Isn't it's, it? a, it's a jacaro, isn't it? It's like a proto jacaro. Oh, was was it a right? jacaro? I thought it was sm- like smaller than a jacaro, but may, may, maybe. maybe not. But may, I, it's been a while since I read the books. I need a monkey. Mm. Like, get me a monkey. <laughs> exactly. What the f- just why a... the fuck is there a monkey in the middle of your force? Well, obviously, just... Ark and Lands, buddy. Just go uh, go for like a, a scan on of any popular 3d <laughs> website and just like shrink the scale all the way down and just print it and hope it works yeah yeah because there's there's um, a few of them in there uh, there's the um I, oh god i need to re-re- re-read the books um and now i'm so excited for the next one the the mechanicum uh woman as well sorry skitari yeah woman yeah. as well yeah a reactor yeah oh, i'm not gonna say i i would dare not Spoil it for anyone that has yeah. not read those books. Incredible books. Yeah, so so I'm I'm looking forward to kind of fiddling around with a few things like that and and doing it. But yeah, the the idea that we've kind of been having for this um campaign is you know we play a game. Maybe it's like defend. We've we've got a like a really big wall section which we got um fr- um which we made through terrain by um Troublemaker Games. And they do like a a wall section, and we combine a couple of um, packs of those with other bits from their uh, terrain kit. To uh, we've made like a if you've seen the Instagrams, it is like a five foot long wall, um, and we've made some with collapsed wall sections and stuff. So, um, I I like the idea of us fighting over a wall one week, and then say the traitors win that week. Then you know the next time we come back, you know, and it's a restack of the same battle but there's a huge mm. collapsed area of the wall to fight over instead. every game the position of the wall moves up as like the focus of the battle is like not outside the wall but getting closer and closer each time as the like the defenders outside the wall are falling back maybe oh there's so much cool stuff yeah the possibilities are endless oh yeah yeah apart from the time the time is not endless time is no. the only thing which is going to fuck us up yeah, exactly, and that's oh uh, man, because I'd love to do. I think we were talking about this at the at the weekend. Um, I would love to do uh, some sort of battle around the um, the tunnel scene. Let's just say. Oh God, yeah, from from um, from uh, Saturnine. It wasn't Sat? It was Saturnine. Yeah, it was okay. Saturnine. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah. Obviously, there's a there's a time limit on the on the mission. 
Yeah. Um, and then at the end of the mission, if the, if any um any units are in a certain area, they they die. They are gone. Um, yeah. And they count as dead for the end of the mission or some something like that. God, that'd be so sick. I I know I, you you've heard all this before because I was ranting about it over the weekend. But I just I loved <laughs> loved that book, like the mm-hmm. the way that kind of Abnett brings together so many threads. Not just in that one, he did it. He, he's done it at numerous points before. Like mm-hmm. Vengeful Spirit was another one. This kind of nexus point of of um of storylines. Um, mm. but that one in particular, I all. I always feel whenever I read and hear these books that the the way that the um the traitors are written because they're all kind of corrupted and they're all kind of like beefcakes um is that they just come across as like most people write them as really OP like they they are yeah. significant powerhouses of people you know and they're just walking through loyalist troops um mm-hmm. and then you get a book like Saturnine and you know you've not you've not really seen certain loyalist elements duking it out for a while yet uh it's been a while they've been hanging around they've been getting their shit together um and then you see i am going to have to stick a spoiler warning up at this point if you don't want to hear what i'm going to be um um, <laughs> yeah, talk, talking about, um, I would probably skip ahead a couple of minutes if you've not read Saturnine and you don't want to um, hear some spoilers. Um, so consider yourself warned. Um, skip ahead. Um, it's it's when um, Little Horus Aximand kind of um, is all cocksure and then all of a sudden he realises that he is absolutely fucked. And he just wa- he finds himself confronted by Loken and this guy who has been an absolute monster of a fighter for most of the time you see him in these books is just dismantled by Loken piteously and swiftly. Like there's no messing around. It's just one minute he's there mm-hmm. and the next minute he's basically not. And that's so satisfying when, it's when so refreshing. Yeah. 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 It's, and it kind of just really sort of, um, highlights how good a fighter how skilled a swordsman Loken was because of course he was like you know a peer of Lucius wasn't he who was arguably mm-hmm. one of the best swordsmen of you know oh, across no, the is, li- is the best I think Loken would probably have something to say about it though you know beat yeah. him in the cages didn't he yeah um but yeah yeah anyway um, you can consider the spoiler warning uh, now finished. I won't talk any more about Saturnine, but I do love that book and I like to kind of harp on about it as much as I can. And we we tangented again. Um, oh dear. Well, we haven't really. We're still talking about the war on on mm. on terror, the the siege of terror. Um, so I think right now is probably a good point that we are going to actually do something we don't normally do on this show and take a, a bit of a short break. Uh, But the reason that we're going to um, take a short break now is because if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to chuck up a slightly different version of the the podcast um, and we're going to put up some videos, some um, photos and a few like Johnny's prepared a um, a, like mini vid of our escapades over the weekend um, without all of the sort of black scene missing um bits on Saturday night. Um <laughs> well I haven't I haven't haven't started it yet, so I hope it's good. If not, I'm sorry yeah. guys. <laughs> so if you want to have a watch of that and you're listening to it on um uh on, on, on an audio platform, then jump on YouTube later on and um cut sort of halfway through the podcast and you'll be able to find um yeah, find the um the videos and get a little bit of a glimpse of our of our weekend if you want but if not the next time you will hear us we will start talking about um greetings from the warp and the battle battle gosh my mouth blah, 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 blah. the battle for the tarant <laughs> Tar- taranith taran taranith taran- <clears throat> the battle for the taranith cluster that's the one that's the one hello everyone good day good morning it is currently 10 past 5 on Saturday morning and I'm about to go to Peaky's to uh, be chauffeured 
to the Greetings from the Warp Titanicus event, 2,500 points. It's so goddamn early. What am I doing? Um, I'm probably going to be late, so I'll have to cut off here, but... Oh, fuck it, I don't know, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. Ciao. How tired are you feeling, Alex? I am pretty exhausted. Yeah. Um, we've been up since four o'clock. Yeah. We road tripped up from Bournemouth, halfway up the country, three hours, lovely um, emergency McDonald's um, at a, a service station, followed yeah. by uh, emergency. Another kind of emergency yeah, stop at a uh, service McDonald's station. McDonald's generated diarrhea about two hours later. Lovely. 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 Um, yeah, it's been um, it's been a long day, but looking forward to four games of, uh, of narrative. Yeah, got my first opponent um, ready, uh, Rich. I'm going to be playing against three different Legio traits. Uh, I'm going to be playing against Graphonicus, uh, Temp uh, no Graphonicus, Tritonus, and Osidax. So I've got a real mix of strats to come up against me. So the Tempestus made it up, um, contrary to what we were discussing on the podcast. Oh yeah. Looking forward to a couple of good games. Hell yeah. All right. Let's go in. Let's do it. We've got a clap for going in as well. So we've got a clap for coming back in as well. Ollie, how's the food? Nice.
Yes, mate. And go. Alex Peake. Johnny Eves. Angron. Angron. Korax Satterblight. What? Korax Satterblight. Demon Prince and Nurgle. Okay. Malkador. Right. Fuck, marry, kill. <laughs> so. Marry, kill. Okay. Um. That is hard. That's what Malkador said. <laughs> um, I would go with. Um, Angron for Mary because I like it rough. Um, I would go for what was the Nurgly dude? That guy. That guy. Callbacks. Oh yeah, he looks like a a, a decent fuck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which means, unfortunately, I'm going to have to kill um, uh, Malkador. There we go. Sorry. Left the Malkador. Yeah, yeah it's decided. Recording. It's recording. All right, Johnny. You realise that it's autumn, yeah, and it's not Hawaiian shirt weather, right? It's Hawaiian shirt weather every day of the year, right, my friend. Okay. Day two of the Taranif cluster. Day two. How are you feeling? Very tired. Yeah. Um, full of meat. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, ready to kick some loyalist buttons. I think so. I think so. Yeah, a bit delicate this morning, aren't we? A little bit delicate. Yeah. yeah. Turns out that you know. We can't hold our alcohol. We can't anymore. hold our alcohol. No, no. Um, you may have, you know, you wouldn't have seen shots of the night, but it was good. Yeah, there's lots of scene missings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, we can't can't really start on YouTube, can we? No. no. Right. <laughs> Should we go and uh, lie down? Let's go. Have well, a play I game. Suppose we need to play some games. First. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. All right.
Okay, back on to part two, which probably seems completely seamless if you're listening to um, uh, the audio version. But if not, you'll have just been graced by some random Something. photos uh, taken when we kind of remembered to take photos um, on the way up over the weekend. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say that both of us had, had a great time. It was a really good event. Yep, got some got some good videos. Um don't know what it's going to look like, but I'll just put them in there, make it look nice, have a nice little royalty-free soundtrack in the background, yeah. and uh, have something cool to watch. See what it's like if you've uh, if you've not been to an event before. You'll see some of the uh, Titan Titan Owners Club uh, Titan walks at full scale, which was insane. Yeah. So it started um, on Saturday. Um, mm-hmm. The um, Battle for the Taraneth cluster kicked off at. Nine o'clock in the morning in Wellingborough in um, Northamptonshire. It still right feels time. like it. Still, I, 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 I you know, I, I'm British. I should know this. It just seems like a lot to say, but I'm mm. probably just making a meal of it with my mouth. Northamptonshire. 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 Yeah, it's hard to say quickly. Um. Uh, and yes, and we found ourselves in Bournemouth, so we had a three-hour drive uh, to get to said narrative event weekend by nine mm-hmm. o'clock, uh, which meant a very early start. And um, myself, um, Johnny, and Oliver, um, who you will remember from the Lania Scara battle, battle Report and the Lania Scara Deep Dive episode of the podcast, if you have watched them, listened to them, um woke up at four o'clock in the morning packed our bags and set off about half past five in the morning to get up there there was a tactical mcdonald's breakfast on the way up um shortly a smart tactical decision no (laughs) not too shortly after there was a tactical stop to get rid of the mcdonald's (laughs) breakfast um which seem to pass through the bodies very, very quickly. <laughs> the calories don't even count, man. You, no. uh, you were still in the next, oh, next fucking yeah. service station. I, I think um, it was just my body being very upset by the fact that it was up far too early. Um, but no, otherwise it was it was a fine drive up, wasn't it? We had a couple of stops, mm. stayed and grabbed a few drinks and stuff from some service stations, and we, we managed to get up. Um, I think we were we, we were either about ten to nine, so in, in good time. Yeah, we, um, got we got there in a good time. Um, yeah, yeah, I was phased out. Yeah, on that drive. Well, you tried to catch a sneaky nap in you bastard. Well, I did also go to bed at one o'clock in the morning uh, on Saturday yeah. because I was painting Titan arms. How? How um, though? Like, is uh, is that is totally self inflicted? Oh, knew ex- absolutely. Yeah, you get no sympathy yeah. from me for that because you knew the time frames involved. I did, I did. No, uh, yeah, it's self-inflicted, but I was still having a out-of-body experience <laughs> while, um, while in, while in the car. Um, but yeah, man, yeah. So, a... so we all got up there, and we followed the sat nav, and the the sat nav turned us into a school, and there <laughs> seemed to be a lot of children arriving at the school, which. Definitely, for a good few minutes, we were very concerned as to whether or not we turned into the right place. Um, yeah. But then we I did had the, had the camera out like a good little vlogger, yeah, uh, and then immediately started Put the camera into away. The school, and I was like, <laughs> "Oh shit!" Like quickly, like unfasten the camera, put the lens cap back on, and stuff it back in my bag. Like, nope, not getting that out again. Yeah, <laughs> this we, car park. we were very concerned we'd not arrived at the right place. Um, until it was that we started seeing increasing numbers of middle-aged men, um, pro- probably kind of of the slightly overweight uh category. <laughs> we're like, ah, oh, we're at home now. <laughs> Like, and then we saw a few people wearing Titan owners shirts, and uh, we're like, "Yeah, okay, fine, right, we are in the right place." There's just a random load of children here. Mm. Um, so we're probably not... the line of ants that are delivering a t- a room's worth of uh, terrain for a 28 mil Titan walk. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Yeah. So, 
so anyway we relaxed a little bit at that point and we realized we were in the right mm-hmm. place um and parked up and, and, and went on in and um, we were in um i i think we were in the best room to be honest because it was nice and bright they had um big door uh big doors open to the outside so although it was pretty cold to start with i was actually quite appreciative of the um the fresh air especially after spending you know all day in a room with a bunch of war gamers um mm-hmm. when you walked kind of next door it was different um let's just say uh but <laughs> it's your local friendly game store times 1000 yeah um <laughs> it, it happens right you get a load of guys in a room yeah. together mm-hmm. <clears throat> um everyone's aware <laughs> but yeah we um we arrived uh we made some quick introductions to the guys uh from the advancing fire podcast and we met up with uh tom um tom and alex um who who run the advancing fire podcast and alex was the guy who was running the event for the weekend there was 12 12 of us who were going to be participating in the narrative event um which was the battle for the taraneth cluster now every single table had been kind of made up as like a planet um from the cluster that you had to fight over and the games basically determined who was in control of the planet if it was the loyalists or if it was the traitors um and each one had its own mission each one had its own way of scoring victory points and ultimately determine um kind of how the the game ran uh, and 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 went and some of them also had some special rules some of which were kind of quite easy to follow some of them were like whoa not not hard to follow but like it it kind of added a real kind of consideration to the way that you were playing mm-hmm. um there were some amazingly goofy uh, special rules where you uh, randomly bounce around in low gravity, um, which was not something you'd really expect to to do in um, in AT constantly. Um, so yeah, it just you were getting caught out by by just bad positioning in some of these scenarios, which was very funny. Um, but it was it's narrative campaign, so you know. This is this is what you do, right? And I think that this is like one of the best types. This is when these are the types of games where you can really kind of throw those sort of battlefield effects in, like we saw in the open engine war, right? Because it's not a competitive environment; it's a bit of fun, um, and it is quite hilarious. Um, like you say, watching what happens as your Titan randomly kind of gets thrown d six inches into a big like wall. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, the, t- the the boards all looked really, really good. The terrain was pretty dense, actually. I thought mm. we were playing on six by four, but bo- um, six by four boards, and it was two thousand five hundred points a side. So they were big games, six by four boards, and there was quite a lot of terrain, which was um, quite quite refreshing to play on. It, it definitely made a lot more considerations for how you move, the line of sight. Um, you know, we we usually play on fairly busy boards but like these were quite quite busy or quite dense so i say um compared to our own kind of standard um but yeah the boards all look great um the missions were pretty well thought out um and yeah we we basically sat down and ready to play our games so i know we we talked a little bit along this on the last um podcast in the end i settled i, I well i couldn't settle on a on a war master uh list there was just kind of i kept falling back on Microphonicus um because like i i like to take to events things that i've painted so mm-hmm. the only other warmaster stuff that i had available was the stuff which was painted by uh, oliver which looks amazing don't get me wrong but like whenever i go to an event like i if if there's going to be any sort of kind of um painting award or something i want to make sure that like i'm not winning an award that sounds very arrogant like i i I want to make sure that the 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 models which are on the table are the ones i've painted so in the event that you know somebody's nominating those that they're nominating it Mm -hmm. you know because that that's what i did rather there's nothing understandable if you speak to johnny core he has no qualms whatsoever about accepting best painted awards for titans that he didn't paint he did that in in 40k (laughs) uh tournaments Mr. Core from the Battle Bling store. But um I I kind of don't feel <laughs> the same slightly. Um so it was gonna fall back on being a Graphonicus list and 
you know, I, I, I've played the Graphonicus so many times. Um, and I just wanted to do something different. And I've not played with my Tempestus since Swansea. Um, so that would have been Mar- May this year. And with 2,500 points, I could take every one that I'd got. Um, so I was able to take a full Arcus and a minimum uh, Perpetua, um, which was really interesting. Both of those were maniples I'd never played before. Um, I've always fancied playing the Arcus, um, but I've never, I've never had the opportunity to take it. And so, with it being a narrative event, I was really keen to sort of see how some of these things play get four games in with them and the perpetua as well i've I've never really kind of considered the perpetua um the perpetua is the one which allows you to pass a um emergency repair orders on a two plus and if you don't move you gain an extra repair roll in the uh, an extra repair, repair dice in the damage control phase uh, which turned out to be pretty tasty even though i couldn't seem to pass any damage control rolls the entire weekend um but yeah, so I, I took I took them. Um, I was kind of quite happy that I did in the end. Nobody took n- nobody really took like the bigger um, engines. The the biggest one that we saw, one guy had brought a Psy Titan, um, mm-hmm. but everything else was largely kind of you know Warhound, uh, sorry Warlords and smaller. Um, so I think there wasn't many people who only taken one. Le- I only took the one Legio because I wanted them all to look the same. Um, there was no penalties for taking a second Legio, um, and some people had kind of like thrown everything into that and just sort of to see what would happen. Some people had um, had been a bit more considered with what they were going to do, and some people like mm-hmm. yourself didn't have a choice. I did have a choice. I absolutely have a choice. Uh, I, I chose not to go full Volper, um, uh, knowing that, you know, I would have to get the rest of the, um, uh, why, why am I saying Warbringer? Warmaster. Warmaster. Warmaster painted, um, which I, I could have done. Um, it would have been uh, a bit of a push though, wouldn't it? I mean, considering you were the, already up until one o'clock the, the night before painting weapon arms. Yeah, um, that would have been a, an all-nighter. I would have just gotten off the painting desk and driven straight to yours at, at four in the morning if I was doing <laughs> that, which I would have fully been down to do. Um, yeah, the, uh, I don't know, the little like demon inside me that really is really, really competitive, which is actually quite a big demon inside me, but I try, try my hardest to suppress it down, um, just just won the argument and made me, uh, made me take the uh Volper Tritonus combo to see how filthy uh, you could discussed. make it and it did pretty well um i was very it felt nice to be winning and, some games of and, and, again, and of course and of course you um it was a random roll that we had to do for our princeps traits and what we rolled was there for the whole weekend so i rolled on yep. like the main table for both my princeps and i got um Favoured by Fortune on my Warlord, which tried and tested, you know, re-roll great. Uh, and I got Will of Iron for my um, Warbringer, which was one I'd never used before. Um, that's the one where if you take a catastrophic damage, or when you take catastrophic damage, you roll a dice, and then you roll another dice. And if the second dice is higher than the result of the first dice, you ignore the catastrophic damage. That kind of introduced some pretty kind of interesting interactions with my Legio abilities of like I, I I forget the name of the ability now, but I shoot when I die if I pass a command mm. check. Because it could basically mean that I get a, a round of shooting, not die, die again the next turn and get another round of shooting. So it, it didn't actually come up, unfortunately, but it was something that was interesting that I was interested to see if he did die, if I could if I could do it. Um mm. But you, however, you jammy bugger. <laughs> as a very brief, as a very very brief summary, um, last podcast we discussed our list. So if you haven't listened to that, give that a listen. Uh, but as a TLDR, uh, I took a all uh, uh, all melee Vulpa Corsair, the the classic mutated Reaver Titans um, that uh, I have used in in the previous battle report before. 
and then supported them with a couple of warlords uh, and some warhounds uh, of Legio Tritonis. And when I tell you that Stygian Vale uh, just keeps melee reavers alive for the like uh, all the game that matters for getting them into combat, um, but then the ability to do that stratagem twice in a game um, by rolling a uh, a free on the on the princeps uh, trait dice for the weekend. Uh, I was very, very happy oh, that, and quite concerned. Was that le- uh, Leader of Arachnos or something? Leader of Arachnos, yeah. yes. Uh, allows you to play Stygian Veil uh, a second time, and it is uh, only two stratagem points instead of the full three to uh, play it the second time, um, which translated to, in the first two turns of the game, um, stuff just couldn't really shoot my Reavers or my other Titans, um, which gave me two turns of, of movement, um, which I really only needed one uh, to get to the enemy's lines and to charge them. And because it's Volpa and because they're mutated and because uh, they have the Volpa special equipment, whatever I charged um, of, of same scale or lower was one shot. Uh, and uh, Warlords were, were, you know, Void Shields, uh, VSG Burnout. And uh, and vulnerable to the returning fire, um, or the following fire of my um, my Tritonis warlords. Uh, it was a it was a, a nasty combo, um, and uh, I did feel there was a couple of moments where I felt a bit guilty. Um, so you so showed you bad man. I, I I did I I didn't I wasn't playing fully optimally, and you know I was being very casual about the whole thing. Um, just you know trying to go for the rule of cool for certain interactions as much as possible and i was also getting distracted by filming this and, as much as i and, could and to be fair like there, there was a guy there who i won't name in shame who took the, the dreaded furians extergamus uh with an ignatum mm. uh <laughs> list as well a bad man mm-hmm. so you both of you were bad man but unfortunately you were both on the traitor's side and i got lumbered yep. with the traitors as well because i wasn't enough traitors so i had to be associated with you boys <laughs> I mean, you naturally are associated with the uh, power gamers anyway, <laughs> uh, so yeah. it really shouldn't feel like a- alien at all to you, Alex. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I, I try and... <laughs> I, I, at least I try and talk a good game, then people are unprepared for it when I actually mm. you know rock up to the table. But as it turned out, like all of the... All three of us, Oliver, Johnny and myself, ended up on the traitor side, uh, which meant that... Um, which was really good, because obviously we play each other all the time, so I don't want to go to mm. an event and then spend the weekend playing the same guys all, all weekend so it meant that all four of my games were against guys i've never played against um mm. and i had um four really really good games um the um the numbers changed slightly on day two uh because tom from advancing fire podcast couldn't make it to the second day so strump uh who is um tom stallard um you may um if you don't know him by that first name strump um he uh he's set he backed out as well the second game to even up the numbers so none of the advancing fire guys actually played on day two unfortunately but um i had four great games against uh richard shep ed and rob um interestingly enough two of them were uh, uh, Ast- uh astroman players and i very rarely see astroman these days so um ed um i played on day two and um Shep, who I played on day one, had taken Astroman um, in various manipals. Um, yeah, it was like I say, it was really nice. One of one, I think, and you, I don't know if I don't think you actually played against him actually, but um, because of the way the day two ended up, but um, the guy who ultimately won uh, the most sporting award uh he won because he got nominations from all four of his opponents like myself and oliver mm-hmm. included and he'd taken um a really interesting list which was actually a lot of fun and i would never normally say those words in conjunction with playing against lots of knights um but he'd <laughs> taken an um a storum lupercal maniple uh with a mm-hmm. direwolf with a volcano cannon um and on top of that he'd t- oh and a warhound with twin conversion beamers which was very brave um 
but uh, on top of that, he'd taken two banners of four Serastus Knight Lancers and two banners of nine Armagers. I apparently he was gift. I asked him, it's like that's a lot of armages, like 40 yeah, quid or however that? much they are for three. Um, <laughs> and they weren't armages, sorry, they were Moirax. Um, mm. and apparently he got a lot of gifts, um, which basically allowed him to. He hadn't actually bought hardly any of them, they'd all been presents and stuff. Um, oh wow, but it looked incredible on the board. Uh, it was, it had all the scariest shit qualities of playing against a night ha- night household whilst still playing and like feeling like you were playing a normal game of AT because he still had Titans on mm. the board. There was kind of none of the night, let's say, shenanigans, uh, which can sometimes throw people off if they've never played a night, night household. There's like quite a lot of rules which are different. Um, when you are a night household or some rules don't apply, and if, if you're not familiar with them, then... You know they they can throw you off if you're unprepared um so yeah it was like the best of both worlds it was still kind of like a really tense exciting game lots of stuff died um but uh, but yeah it wasn't like totally overwhelming and he had a bit more to think about as well because some of the criticisms that i've heard from people i know who played knights have said when it comes to sort of playing knights, there's not really much that you need to think about. You just put them all on full stride, which when they're in a household, lance order, one dice roll for a lot of them, and off they go. Move them up the table as fast as you can and charge. Um, whereas he, there was a lot more tactical elements to it, the way that he was playing it, because he was obviously taking them as an allied, not, as um, reinforcements, rather than mm. as a, a separate banner. Um, so that was that was really... That was really good. All, all the games I had were really, really good. But um, I, I came away from it, though, with my mind completely blown because uh, Rob pointed out that I've been playing the Shaken rules for, for Knights completely wrong all, like, for three years that I've been playing them. And I think, to, to be fair, um, I think I've never really come across this scenario before where... Um, this rule that we've been playing wrong would normally have kicked in um because in my experience knights either are kind of like dying one at a time or they just get annihilated by a bellicosa or something and you're taking a whole lot off the table um but for some reason and it's not only me like it seems like our entire meta had been playing this way and not only our entire meta but it seems like multiple metas across the Discord had also been playing it exactly the same way. Um, mm. And there, there'd been this weird kind of Mandela effect um, with the Shaken rules that you lose a knight, or any number of knights, if you lose knights in the combat phase, you roll a Shaken dice at the end of the um, firing the weapon and see if they're Shaken. Which is wrong. You don't. There's, there's nowhere that says that you do it. You take them for each knight that you remove. So if you lose four knights, you roll four times, which like completely wow. it blew my mind. It completely blew my it's mind. Huge. Yeah, and it wasn't as if this was an edge case kind of like interpretation of the rule. Granted, it had changed a couple of times, and it was finally kind of consolidated in the um, campaign compendium um, under their rules. But like, it's it's pretty clear. And I've got no idea where we got this kind of perception from or where everybody else who like has been playing it the same way had been playing it like. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess it's only really become more obvious now we've got things like uh, Armages and Moirax in the game. Because you know, to kill a Serastus, you pump in a lot of firepower into that. And more often than not, you're removing them from criticals or stuff. But at most, you're probably mm-hmm. killing two a turn or the whole banner depending on your dice roll right um most people field them in in banners of three so by the time that you've killed you know one at a time or two they they go off quite quickly so you're only really rolling once but um with more with more racks and armages now if you roll like four devastating hits well that's four dead armages Mm -hmm. so that's four shaken rolls which you roll every time you lose one uh, which they need a six up to pass on. So, like, it is quite a significant 
difference in the way that we'd been playing the game versus how obviously the rules had been written. Um, mm, it's definitely a lot more impactful, isn't it? Yeah, massively so. But I mean, like in a, in a household rule, in a household, there is loads of stuff in there which can help mitigate shaken rules. Mm. And um, yeah, there was concern of like, you know, oh no, this is a nerf to to knights. And I'm like, but, you know, I think it was Jim from Twisted Titanica said it's like, or or is this actually like a balancing thing? Yeah. Which we'd never really considered before, because like if you take the High King for instance, the High King, his banner can never be shaken, ever. Insane. So straight up, there you go. Reason to have a big banner with him. Um, and then you've got things like the battle standards, which allow rerolls. So the 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 main downside, as I can see, is it's going to generate a lot of rolling of d10s and rerolling of d10s. But your average Serastus is going to pass a shake and test on a three up anyway it's just when you kind of get to the armages and moirax where it's six that they're more likely to be shaken but kind of expect those little buggers to be shaken if they're getting hit with a bellicosa cannon you know a tiny little armager going yeah, up sure. against a wall or titan or something um but yeah that completely blew my mind and like mm. i i think i probably would have felt upset if it had been me who'd been on the receiving end of that, because it was such a different way than we uh, I was used to playing. But like when he said it and he was saying, no, no, I need to roll now four dice uh, for these armages. And it's like, I felt like it's like you're, you're nerfing yourself. Like, why would you give yourself a... <laughs> and then he just look, have a look at the rule book. I was like, fair. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how have I missed Says this? Says it verbatim. Yeah. How have I missed this rule in three and a half years of playing Adeptus Titanicus? Mm. Um. I think the answer is not many people play knights around here. Uh, it's also it's also a, um, uh, a hangover from playing other games, workshop games, right? You know, if you have a squad of uh, guardsmen that that fail a morale check, it's not per model that's died. It's um, you do it for the squad. Yeah, I think they've lost they've lost guys. I think that's valid, and and also every other command check you do is one dice roll. Mm-hmm. So, like you know a command check for it's only affecting one titan yeah well exactly that right yeah yeah but i guess you it like i say it was it was a weird mandela effect because loads of people swore mm. blind that that what you know that wasn't how we did it but n- we couldn't find anything that said otherwise like whereas the rule was pretty clear so i really like it when i go away from an event having played another another meta who is not mm. kind of like the the echo chamber that can be the people who you end up playing the same time, uh, sorry, the, all the time, um, who play the same way as you because you don't get challenged on these things. Um, mm. And it was really, really good to walk away from that, not only with a positive game experience, but having learned something that it, it just goes to show after three and a half years, I'm still working out how to play the fucking game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean,. <laughs> You know, like I say, it's we good though. It's good. It's nice to find these little things, and like you said, it's not a um, you know, it's not a thing you come across that often. No, not if your meta doesn't have a lot of night players. I think it'd be different if there was a lot of um, uh, households in your meta, but there isn't really down here. It's always support banners, and like I say, they usually die. So, so we might have got that wrong a little bit when we did that bat rep earlier on in the year. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty mm. sure that like I, I should have been rolling more shaken dice. Um, for for my armages, for instance, when we were doing that, but every day is a school day. Um, there you go. I'll count that as a win then. Yeah, I, you felt. So I, I had I had four games <laughs> um, across the weekend. I went away with uh, three wins. I won my first three. I actually lost the game against the night player. How did you do, Johnny? Uh, well, I I got the same as you. I got uh, three wins, one loss, which I was uh, very pleased with. Um, I went up against uh, Ed, Tom, uh, Shep, and Richard. Yeah. Um, which was, oh, they're all really, really insane games. Um, yeah, had, had it was, it was, it, they were great. The great opponents. Um, Ed was playing Astroman, <laughs> which yeah, like you said, uh, very rarely do you see uh, Legio Astroman. And there was three. Two, players? I think it was. Two players, mm. okay, yeah. Oh, and then, no, the uh, third player was someone 
from the Titan Zona Club in the same pool that we were in. Oh yeah, that uh, was near it. where we were playing with a with a with a twenty eight mil um, scale Astroman uh, Wall of Titan, which is very very cool to see. When, when, sorry to just interrupt you. When we when we were setting up for my first game of the weekend with Richard, um, this guy came in wheeling five twenty eight millimeter Warlords on a big trolley into the room, and and Richard just looked at the trolley and said. That's worth more than my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was yeah like, the... <sighs> there was some money. There was some money in that room. Um sorry, carry on anyway. No, I I, I mean I was I was blown away by it by the, the fact that it was three, you know, different uh boards. They could you know, boards, what do you call them? It's floor hammer, but you're using half of a a, a kid's uh, dance hall to <laughs> To fit the the you know table in, um, really really cool to see. Uh, obviously those those guys are, uh, are funny as well. Um, so yeah uh, yeah Ed was awesome opponent. Um, yeah had had a really really good game. Um, it was Ed's first uh, tournament, first actual uh, event in Titanicus, um, and. I found in the past with with kind of like you know melee stuff, people maybe uh, who are less experienced uh, in in like Titanicus uh, scenes um, underestimate the the threat of of melee. Find out the hard way, uh, and find out the hard way. Um, so I I, I you know I I hope I you know didn't um, didn't feel like I was power gaming uh, too much in that first game, um, but I was also you know getting to grips with the um, uh, with with working two legios at the same time, which is a very unique experience, um, did make uh, a slight increase to the mental load, um, but was fun to kind of combo them off uh, each other as well. Yeah, I think um, uh, Richard had taken three Titan legions, hadn't he? Yeah. He'd taken a Graphonicus Manipal. He'd take I think he was a Graphonicus Axiom. I want to say a mm. um, o- uh, Osidax Venator and a detached Tritonus Warlord. And he admitted, like, the amount of load on trying to remember all of those Legio rules and all of their abilities and the Maniple rules was kind of quite mm-hmm. a lot to kind of take in. And also, he, he hadn't run them before. So he hadn't kind <laughs> of... Or, or, or I think he'd run the, the um, Osidax ones before, but certainly Graphonicus he was not overly familiar with. Um mm. You know, and I think it was. He said it was kind of like a, a crazy idea that he'd had the night before um, the event. So there was definitely an element of kind of overwhelming yourself if you took a little bit too much. There was a lot to think about. I didn't have to worry about that so much because I just had the one one Legio and the two new maniples that I was getting to grips with. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's the thing is that you know we uh, at least with my list they're two. Two uh, legios I know quite quite well at this point. Uh, it's because they're only, the only two I have at the moment. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of helping a little bit. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's very different, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Wasn't it lovely yeah, though to it, play in a non-competitive environment <laughs> for a well, change? When I say um, that that this event has like massively reignited my love with uh, with AT. Um, you know, I I one hundred percent mean it. You know, I wasn't necessarily not liking AT before, but there's loads of really cool releases at the moment. Um, Legion and Imperialis is obviously right around the corner, um, but that even is kind of you've lost interest because all the delays. You were getting like your that. eye turned, weren't you? You were the guy in the. I meme. was getting my eye turned by, yeah, literally. Uh, and you know, I I was I'm I'm really big into uh, Infinity the game at the moment by Corvus uh, Belly, um, and I have been for for a little while now. And so there's there's been a lot of kind of things that have been distracting me, loads of like small indie game or specialist game stuff that I've just been right randomly turning up to events to um to just have a good time, a bit more time. Uh, it's always fun. Uh, and so this was kind of like my first I mean this was the first game I had played in in quite a considerable time. Um quite possibly since the, the last summer. one I played before that was since the summer because we were playing in your garage. Yeah. So it really had been months, and 
due to, as we've mentioned, you know, lots of uh, real life work and uh, non-work stuff going on yeah. at the moment. We couldn't even fit in a, a practice game before before the event. So it was, um, you know, it's like riding a bike though. It comes back to you quite quickly. Uh, but the first couple of rounds uh, were a bit shaky. I had to shamefully look at the, the order of uh, setting up again just to make sure that <laughs> we were doing it right. Um, but yeah, no. Really, really, really good games across the weekend. Really, really fun. Um, all my opponents were were awesome. Uh, game two was against uh, Tom from Advancing Fire. Um, it was a swingy game, to say the least. Uh, really, really strong start. Um, I pretty much felt like the game was in the bag. Tom was getting really unlucky uh, with his rolls. I was getting very lucky with my rolls, which is a rarity when it comes to me. Um, and then about midway through the game, luck turned um, and it it started to derail out of hand for me quite quickly. And suddenly uh, I realized I was on the losing foot, um, but couldn't kind of react in time to, to do anything about it. Um, it was very close. I believe the final score... I didn't note it down. I believe it was something like 20 to 21. There was like a one point difference, yeah. um, which was, you know, insane. It really was a testament to how, how close and how chaotic the game was. Yeah, I think on that um, board you were scoring, um, I think it was two points for, so there was three objectives in, in both um, both deployment zones and you were scoring mm -hmm. two points um, for each one that you control and an additional point if you scored, uh, if you were controlling all three. So it was like seven around, wasn't it, that you could potentially score? Absolutely. And it's quite unique in, uh, for Titanicus to have a, a rolling scoring objective. Usually Titanicus uh, are scored at the end of the game. Yeah. Uh, if you have completed these conditions, you get these points. Whereas this was more like a, uh, a 40k mission where you are generatively, you know, uh, gaining VP as you are playing the rounds and uh, moving through the game. Uh, so that, was, that felt very different. Um, but it was really cool. It was nice to kind of mix it up. Um, and yeah, the COD, the game was so, so close. Um, it was very, very easy again for me to move up my Reavers. Um, a few poor targeting decisions from me, uh, kind of maybe helped Tom, um, kind of exploit a, a weakness in my line. And suddenly I was a, a few Reavers down, even after he had lost a, a Warlord and a Reaver himself to quite a nasty, uh, chain reaction i believe that was going on in the corner um it, yeah it just it swung in his favor um really really awesome opponent though i had a very good laugh just chatting shit over the table that, i mean that, i can say the same for every game um it's not it wasn't a competitive tournament every time i'd, I'd you know be like oh i don't know about this or i don't know about that it's just like i just shrug and i'll just say you know it's narrative let's just let's just do whatever you know roll a dice uh, or go for the coolest option yeah, um, you know, there was a situation where uh, I had um, I had lost the uh, a Titan that was in like a very precarious position, uh, I think near my lines or something like that, and uh, my opponent had rolled number one, like um, oh, what's the wording for it? What's the name of it on the destroy Titan table? The number one, the, um, full yeah. silent, full silent, and I was like, oh, that's so like anticlimactic and boring. Just like re-roll it, and we got like a mag debt or something like that, and it it blew up and caused low chaos and that was that was really fun not having to worry you know obviously you want to win you want to you know get awards at the end and stuff like that but also um having fun was was number one priority for sure at this event um it was there, really cool there, there was quite a few cool little special rules like i think that that one that you were playing on that you were just talking about there um there was an attacker and a defender and the defender was getting like <laughs> these um it was like d3 strength eight um small blast template bombardments for free every movement phase mm. and then the attacker was getting d3 plus one strength seven um small ones in the end phase and you got extra points and extra victory points if you destroyed a titan with those bombardments um so it's like nice little battlefield effects like that going on um the the missions like generally speaking were were, were really well thought out and kind of really um fun to play um that one in particular was probably my favorite board to play on um out of all of the ones that i did 
um because they were like home homemade missions though i guess you know that there was um some elements which um maybe didn't work quite so well on some boards uh which probably needed tweaking for next time um so like for instance on the board that i played the my last game which i played against rob which was the night player which i ultimately lost on a really interesting um battlefield effect basically every time you push the reactor you had to roll an additional reactor dice and pick the worst result so you would roll two reactor dice if one had one heat the other had two heat you would take two heat which was very interesting for rob running a storeroom because he did like that war march not war march what's it called is it war march the the am i getting that confused with the mortis one basically the one where he gets the additional inches in the um mm. uh, first and second turn and if he does that he has to roll two um reactor dice well of course that means that he had to roll three reactor dice and pick the worst um <laughs> So that was really really cool, but the um, the like the only criticism that I had about that particular board was just the fact that um, it was a six foot board. It was corner um, diagonal deployment, um, and the mission was you had to get near a building which was um, in your opponent's deployment zone and destroy it. Well, of course, the first thing that we both did was we put the building right in the corner of the six foot by um four foot <laughs> board which meant that there was something like an 80 inch building to building um distance between the two of them we only had five turns to play through um and it and if you sat something on top of the building then you had to get through what sorry yeah sat, sat on the objective you had to get through them which although you scored 10 point if you basically if you got near it in the end phase it was destroyed so a little bit like salt the earth um, from the match play guide but you had to get to it and traveling the best part of 72 inches even without a wall of knights in the way was was always going to be a significant um challenge for any legio even a fast legio to kind of get and and achieve even his lancers moving to potentially 24 inches a turn didn't get over there in time I had combat drop, so I was actually capable of achieving it. So I dropped my combat dropper guy down there. There was a warhound sat on the objective. I thought, I'm going to put him down there. I'm going to try and take him out, at least draw him out so I can see if I can get it. There's a chance that I might get it. Um, ultimately, um, I wasn't able to because we ran out of time. Um, the two and a half thousand point games take a long time um mm. I, I i don't think that i managed to get past turn three on any of the games that i played against i think one maybe i got to turn four um and really i think we needed to possibly have a bit longer um for games like mm. maybe four hours a game to, to actually get through them um and then they might have been like some of those things might have been achievable but that last lost for instance there was often like a a uh, i think the same thing happened to oliver as well um there was 10 points if you killed the objective and there was also an additional d3 if you killed an opponent's princeps um so you, you there was always that potential that you were going to roll a little bit higher depending on if you killed your princeps or not and get a few more extra vps but otherwise it was if you didn't destroy the opponent's objective roll a d6 that's how many victory points that you you get and of course neither of us got it so ultimately the game was decided on a d6 roll off who wins you win i win um mm. and kind of despite the fact that he killed none of my guys and i'd killed two banners of his and a couple of warhounds i rolled a three he rolled a four so he won um which was you know i didn't mind because it was a narrative event at the end of the day as well but i think there just maybe needed to be a couple of um tweaks to that to kind of make it make a little bit more i guess narrative sense rather than it just yeah. feeling like a you know shall we just roll the dice and see who wins um scenario but i don't want that to sort of take away from from the rest of mm. it like it was it was a really good weekend um it just so sort of happened that there was a couple of games which were ultimately decided purely on a roll of a d6 mm. and you know it's hard to um to when you're putting together these custom 
missions. You know, there's always stuff that you overlook. Um, and most of the time you're going for all of cool. Uh, but yeah, th these things happen. Um, I think maybe if, if you had kind of, uh, um, if you had maybe foreseen, you know, the situation happening or, uh, or people were aware of it from playing on the, the mission previously, there could have been like a, there could be a, an adjustment the players could agree on where it's like, okay, let's be sensible about the deployment of our objectives so that we don't take the piss and basically just, you know, can't score the game. Um, cause it, again, you know, is, is narrative. Um, but that, that board as well wasn't, wasn't played on until day two. So yeah, nobody yeah. had played on it on day one. So oh, it was a gorgeous board. It was a great well. looking board. Really good. It was like oh. a, um, a forest board, which was really fun jungle. to play on a uh, jungle board. Yeah. Mm. Really fun to play on. Uh, but like you say, maybe there could have been some adjustments after day one or something, realizing sort of what was going on there. But for the most part, like they they all really worked. Cool. Like that was yeah. that was the only one which um, kind of like made me think from from my own perspective. If I'm planning some narrative events, the things that I need to consider, you know, maybe what what should have happened was that it, that objective maybe had to be one inch outside of your deployment zone or something so it was like in the middle of the board and you could sit something on it but you had to go forward and get it or or something mm -hmm. like that there's or i think on the match play guide there's things like it has to be at least six inches onto the board or like 12 inches away from any table edge i think it just needed something like that and they would have been completely fine um yeah but i think oliver when he played on that board um, his opponent did exactly what we both did and put it straight in the corner and Oliver being Oliver and just hit there for a laugh, like placed it kind of normally in his objective uh, in, yeah. in his deployment zone, didn't really think about it. I don't think he lost it in the end. I think that also came down to a D6 roll off. But um, mm. in hindsight, if I'd have killed his Princeps Senioris, which was very nearly doable, I would have gotten an extra D3 um, victory points, which might have twisted it. Like Likewise, if it had gone to a turn four, um, mm. I definitely would have scored the full ten, um, but it's it's all good stuff to kind of take away and learn. And like, I won't let that take anything away from my enjoyment of the weekend. It was it was oh, great fun. Definitely not. It was very funny. I, I think I think a lot of these um, when you you turn up to the table and you're like, right, what's the mission here? And you open up the pack and you go, oh, what the what the fuck is this? Like, this is <laughs> going to be ridiculous. What do you mean my my Titan is randomly on the scattered dice every year? Uh, every turn and possibly bouncing off in a random direction and blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, why am I re keeping track of all these artillery strikes and this sort of stuff? And then you play it and you're like, wait, this is, this is fucking sick. Like, this is so cool. Uh, this is so much fun. Adds uh, a very refreshing new element to a game of AT that we would just yeah. not play in a normal I mean, settings. Cause I think my, we're both competitive players at heart, you know? Yeah. My, my initial reaction was, you know, and, and Alex said at the start of it, it was like, you know, you can either play these rules or you don't feel free to use the special effects or don't. Um, and I, um, my first reaction was like, let's not, there's enough to think about. But then my opponent's like, oh, let's do it. And then we're like, you know what? Yeah, all right. And then I played that one. I was like, actually, that was pretty cool. And I got into it a little bit more. And then I played all of them. I played all the special rules. And it was, yeah, it was, it was hilarious. It was great fun. There was maybe one or two turns where you just like both players forget to you know pick up on them but i think that happens on normal rules and well it was it was on on the um board that um we were talking about earlier on with the artillery bombardment the first turn um we both rolled a d10 um scatter and then we were like hold on a second that was supposed to be a d6 and we said you know what mm. in fact we realized it on his go um when he was supposed to roll it's like i rolled a d10 for that it's supposed to be a d6 and we were like you know what I'll roll a d10 for this turn as well, and then we can kind of consider that to be like the artillery zeroing in their targets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like from turn two, we'll do it with a d6, and it becomes more accurate. You know, we just kind of sort of went with it, and um, yeah, it just added a nice little. Um, and not on top of that as well, that people were getting like, um, if you if you your side controlled the the world, so you got a little bonus. Um, so on that one there, it was a loyalist controlled world. In fact, it, it felt like I was the guy being sent in to retake the uh, the lost planets because I didn't. Apart, I think it was the last game I actually got to got one of these bonuses because I I won the first three games. I was taking all these planets, and then you guys kept losing them again. Uh, <laughs> but like on that one there, I turned up on this planet. Lost one game. <laughs> 
But I turned up on his planet, and it's like, this is Loyalist Control. I was like, great. He gets a free strafing run um, strategy. I was like, great. And deployed, and then he was like, strafing run. I was like, yeah, of course you are, because all of my Titans are in a nice long row oh, along, right. my, along my deployment yeah. zone. So like, right I, off the gut. I... I played that mission as well, but I, the traitors had control of the planet when I played that mission, so I got the free strafing run, and it was it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was like you say, it made, it, from a narrative perspective, it made loads of loads of sense. Like mm. there was me landing on the planet, in come the the planes, strafe me on my deployment zone as I'm getting up. Then the, the artillery starts kind of hammering me and stuff. It was it was awesome. It was great. That I was a great game. That was to be said. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about uh, about using um published stuff but just tweaking it so providing stratagems for free as opposed to like coming up with uh with your own designs i think it's like a really smart move as well uh because then you know people know what it does already and it is it is balanced in the in the game of at well of course in the compa- uh, campaign compendium they introduced some of these winning battlefield effects so i think if we and when we do our own narrative event I- i'll definitely be looking to include some of these things but i think in for you know just sake of ease and accessibility we'll probably pick something from the book and just make sure of some of it's all available um but yeah um yeah I, great experience the guys were amazing um it was lovely to see you know so many titans and uh, honestly the titan walk was spectacular like i've seen them at beachhead and stuff but that's just a fraction of what these things are like probably hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of models on display oh um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was actually the figure and but... and apparently i was speaking to lee um lee marshall uh, at the event only two titans uh got smashed so um y- yay <laughs> he showed, that a good number i don't know he showed me this picture yeah. of some guy's warlord in pieces on the floor and i was like oh that hurts and he was like it's okay he wanted to take it to pieces anyway so he could strip it and repaint it It was like well that's lucky what <laughs> that's lucky uh well i guess i i guess if you want a new war ha- a warlord it's a lot easier to uh well, luckily <laughs> luckily it hadn't smashed it. like it would just like just where it was glued on it would just kind of come to pieces but um yeah some guy backed up into it and the whole thing went over and just hit the floor like honestly made me a little bit you know like when you get that feeling in your balls when you like just been kicked like mm-hmm. it was a little bit like that um like this sick kind of feeling in the back of my throat um but um but yeah it was truly incredible to to see all that as well and then there was all of our little titans on display um it was great and yeah i think we all did a good showing um the traitors ultimately won um we seized what was it it was something like was it seven out of ten worlds or eight out of ten worlds or something um which ultimately fell um to the to the war master which i was reluctantly part of because i turned up ready to play as a loyalist but never mind welcome to the dark side let's go yeah um yeah, so you were the the slayer of kings, really. You got the most warlord and warbringer kills. Let's um, go, Tom from um, Advancing Fire Podcast, and I forget who the other guys were who got it, but two, it was like a three way split of people who killed the same amount of reavers. And myself and uh, Doctor Alex, who um, who we I've known for for years, and he happens to live in uh, Northampton, so um, he was there for the event as well. We we were tied with eight Warhound kills each, and I was the mighty Slayer of Knights. And that was mostly because my opponents kept walking bunches of tightly grouped knights out in front of my two Bellicosa cannons. Uh, I had two games where... I'm wondering when they died. (laughs) I had had two games where the the first thing they did was move their knights, and I was like, I'm going to fire my first firing Arcus Warbringer then, uh, which scatters D6 inches. Um... And the first dice roll of the game removed an entire night banner, like 330 points in the first game I played, and then like a banner of three quest doors in the second. So yeah, I killed the most knights. Um, but yeah, it was it was great fun. Uh, like I say, Rob uh, walked away with the most sporting. He had received nominations from um, all four of his opponents, including me and Oliver, who'd played um, him on day two. I think it was day two. No, he played in day one, didn't he? Um, and Ed 
got um the peer voted best um loyalist battle group with his um astroman they were really really nice like i they they voted for him I'd yeah i voted for him as well they were they were a great looking legio and uh and then yeah that just left somebody else to um um Christ, here we go somebody else oh. to to walk away with the the the, the peer voted best traitor and the, can't believe they gave you both and the judged best painted overall best painted so yeah so two two no, two more bits of bling to go on my uh, my wall thank you very much how many days to go up on the uh, Facebook page? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the ego has landed. Oh Christ! They got to stop giving you these. <laughs> it should be like it should be like painting tournaments where you can only win at one event with them, and then that's it. <laughs> uh, I mean, to be fair, they've only won at two events. Granted, okay. they've won at both events that I've brought them to. But in my defence, I did not require a cake stand this time. And at least this time as well, you weren't also running the event. I wasn't running the last event. Oh, just, you know, in general, for when you uh, have your own awards that you hand out to yourself occasionally. That happened once, and I wasn't running the yeah. event. Ben was yeah. running the event, and George was running the oh, event. I okay. was just playing. You were just playing as, okay. And that was my Gryphonicus, so it totally doesn't count. But yes, mm. it's been yeah, that my meme pile. of uh, Obama giving... Obama and another medal. Obama and medal, yeah. <laughs> I need to, yeah. <laughs> hey, look, I do it with the best interests of the channel. It's nice to get photos on the Maximal Fire website of of us accepting awards or me accepting awards. When you win awards, Johnny, we'll get photos of you uh, up on the Maximal if, Fire. If I ever get website. the only, only Titanicus award I have won is the is the wooden spoon. Oh no, and best sport actually. You won best sport, didn't you? Yeah. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> Right. Uh, it says the best sport. I'm just going to have to step away two seconds because my cat is going burko batshit on my door. Alrighty then. Shut up. Oh my God. The paintwork. I'm going to have to be repainting. Um... But yeah, that was greetings, yeah. greetings from the wall. Would you go back again, Johnny? Oh, absolutely not. No. Terrible time. Awful, wasn't it? Right. No. Yeah. Ugh. Not worth it. Disgusting. Right. No. No, of course I would. Man, that was so cool. That yeah. was good fun. Um, was, I think it was exactly what everyone there that all, you know who we went with, um, both ourselves and and Oliver, uh, needed as well. So it was just at the perfect time. Um, you know, yeah, it was every, it was everything we hoped it would be, and, right? Yeah, it was great. It was good fun. It was so relaxed. Um, you know, even even though there was there was time constraints, we we. It felt relaxed. You weren't rushing to do it because at the end of the day, it was just a narrative event. Yeah. Um, and that was just such a nice weight off off your shoulders when you're playing an event. There's a lot more, there's a lot less mental load because you can actually just, you know, let yourself just take it easy and forget stuff. And um, organizers were oh, such great hosts. Um, food carts were being trolled oh. around. Oh, that guy. Oh. I love that guy. Like, he, 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 all that was missing was little dinner lady outfit. That he could have worn, pushing this little sh- uh, shopping cart over. No, no, like the the woman from the Harry Potter Hogwarts Express. Anything from the trolley. A- anything dear. from the trolley. <laughs> anything from the trolley. Like, he just turn up every now and again with a plate full of not oh well, a, a trolley full of chocolate, um, like coke, tango, beer. Like, do you take card? Absolutely, he took card. Like, made a killing. Absolutely, he took yeah, card. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that you know, that the, the, actually, the... I think, was one of the highlights for me. That is the thing which somehow needs to get incorporated into our future events because that game changer. Those that go to events know that you do a lot of talking, and so you're like, you know, you get a bit clammy, your throat you know, starts to hurt, maybe, and all you want is a drink. You can't really stop the game midway through to run off to a vending machine or something like that. And I had multiple moments that weekend where I was like, oh, all I want is a a drink and like a, a a mythical being just appearing out of nowhere there was a trolley coming around at exactly that time and uh loaded with all, all manner of soft drinks and, and water and you stuff. know what i think we need to take it to the next level and we'll have we'll have to work out how we can get a trolley person um coming mm. around with stuff but then also we somebody put oliver in a made outfit yeah i'm sure he'll be game 
that can be his mm-hmm. role at Beachhead. Um, oh, yeah. But maybe we need to also hire somebody who's trained in sports massages who can go around and oh. rub people's legs at the same time. Oh, legs and feet. Legs oh, and yeah. feet. By day two, just give my legs and feet a rub. <laughs> yeah. Just hobbling, hobbling out of that hall like a, a bunch of OAPs. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, my lower back. Because you spend the whole... Oh, I sound like a proper fucking boomer. I uh, You spend the whole time just kind of <laughs> half lent over a table. You know, I turned 40 the other week, so I'm no spring chicken anymore. Um, but... Yeah, it's just oh, just somebody walking around, just giving you a, a shoulder massage. I think that would be game. Ch- I think we could add ten pounds to the ticket and get in a professional oh, yeah. masseuse. I think that that's what's going to have to happen. Okay, let us know That'd what you think incredible. in the comments. If you would like a, a massage <laughs> as well as a a game of AT, then uh, perhaps Maximal Fire events are uh, are for you. Um, we did get a little bit of stick from a few people over the weekend there, didn't we, for um, not really staying true to our tagline. Mm. Yeah, it turns out that uh, you don't always want to go maximal. I know it's hard you to believe, right? Occasionally. It's hard to yeah. believe that you don't always want to go maximal. Although Richard always wanted to go maximal because he had experimental weapons on his ap- Apocalypse missile launchers, which then got upgraded with... Um, overcharged cannon so he was firing out always strength eight missiles always going maximal um so <laughs> if you've got an overcharged cannon you should always go maximal um yeah but i think we promised this time that on this one off uh we, we're gonna have to slightly change our our sign off today um mm-hmm. based on the fact that we apparently aren't true to our words so apologies to anybody yeah. who thinks that this is the mantra that we live by um, but on a rather sombre note today, um, we're going to have to sign this this show off slightly differently. Before I do, though, if you haven't filled out the survey yet, uh, the Maximal Fire survey, please go ahead and do do so. Tell us what you think. It's been up for a couple of weeks. Going to leave it open for a bit longer. Links in the description down below. Let us know what you think about the content that we're putting out. What you want to see next year. Um, also, kind of just general things like have you used our website? You know, do you subscribe on YouTube? All of that kind of stuff. So, one of the interesting things I've seen so far is that a lot of you who do listen to us on audio aren't subscribed to us on YouTube for obvious reasons. However, if you're not. Even if you don't use YouTube, but you still have a YouTube account, head on over to YouTube and please hit that subscribe button because every single subscription that we get helps with the dreaded YouTube algorithm. So even if you don't watch us on on YouTube or if you do watch us on YouTube and you haven't yet done so, please consider hitting the like button and also hitting that subscribe button um, so you can always um, find out what is what is going on and when the next episodes and bat reps and all of that other exciting stuff that we've got ready for 2024 is going to drop so absolutely on the somber note as we hang Mm. our heads low in shame it gives us just enough time to say always remember to go medium go reasonably loud and occasionally go maximal